I don't really feel like other authors are my direct competition. Readers read so many books that they're just interested in finding other great authors. And so whenever I help another author, you know, usually like six months or a year down the road, that'll come back and it'll benefit me because maybe they'll expose my work to some readers. So there's a very um, pay it forward mindset in, in this industry. And um, once I discovered that, I, I really got excited and sort of addicted to teaching other people how to do this and, and seeing them succeed. So I've helped I don't know, at least 100 authors go from thinking about writing their first book to doing this full time. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now onto the show with your host, Ella Barnard. Hey, bosses. Real quick, if you're interested in getting live coaching from me, joining a community of amazing writers and participating in monthly Q&As with guest authors from this podcast, then you'll want to come check out the Author Boss Academy. You can find out more about the Academy at authorlikeaboss.com forward slash academy. Hello, bosses. Hello, everybody. We are here with the amazing, I'm so I'm really grateful and excited to be talking with Chris Fox. He's been writing since he was six years old and started inflicting his work on others at age 18. By age 24, people stopped running away when he approached them with a new story. And shortly thereafter, he published his first one in The Rifter. Now he's written tons of sci-fi and fantasy, plus has some great books and YouTube channel at Chris Fox Writes, where he helps indie authors make money with their books. Chris, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Ella. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. You guys, Chris is very low key, and I have a feeling we're going to learn a lot and have fun. Okay. So, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your author journey? Uh, sure. So like most authors listening to this, I started at a very young age wanting to tell stories. And I, I really enjoyed that process. Um, but as I got older, I also realized that it was really, really hard to make a living doing it. And so right around the time I was 18, um, I tried to finish my first novel, I had no idea what I was doing. And it never occurred to me that I actually should sit down and read some books on writing and that would teach me. <laughs> Instead, I, I just sort of quit. Um, and, and I took a lot of years off and I stopped writing. And off and on for for the rest of my life, um, I've sort of gone back to it. But it wasn't until probably 2010 that I started to realize maybe I could get my stories out to people. Because for my entire life, there's been that sort of um, traditional gatekeeper where if you wanted to get a novel published, you needed to go to a publisher and you need to learn how to query agents. And then an agent had to get you a book deal. And you know, it was a whole involved process. And those gatekeepers got to choose what audiences were getting to read. And so if you were writing a book, you had to be cognizant of what even agents were buying. Like if they didn't want zombie books, you couldn't write zombie books. Uh, and my problem is I wanted to write whatever I felt like writing. And so I kept doing that for a long time. And then one day I stumbled across the uh, concept of Kindle Direct Publishing and, and realized that people were publishing their books on Amazon. And at that time, I was dating um, the woman who later became my wife, Lisa, uh, and I was trying to impress her. She had found my website and read some of my short stories uh, and had asked what I was working on. And so I had a nearly completed novel. And I worked my tail off for probably another six months after we started dating to get that book ready and then to publish it on Amazon. And, and my intent was not to make any money. I just wanted to be able to hand this pretty girl a book and say, look, I did this. Um, and, and so uh, she was suitably impressed, uh, enough that we're still together. But what I found in the process is I happened to work in the startup world at the time is that there actually is a way to get your book directly to the market and that readers who uh, purchase 80% of the books in the world on Amazon don't care who the publisher is at all. All they care about is what does your cover look like? What does your blurb look like? Does your title sound interesting? And so all of a sudden, overnight, the gatekeepers sort of disappeared. And I looked around and realized, wait a minute, we can make a fortune as indie publishers if we're willing to do stuff ourselves. But as I looked around, there, there were no resources back in, in 2013 and 2014 for doing this stuff. And so I started sharing and so did a lot of other authors right around the same time. We all created blogs. I created a YouTube channel. Um, and just sort of kind of giving stuff away, trying to help indie authors, because unlike any other industry I've been a part of, I don't really feel like other authors are my direct competition. Readers read so many books 
that they're just interested in finding other great authors. And so whenever I help another author, you know, usually like six months or a year down the road, that'll come back and it'll benefit me because maybe they'll expose my work to some readers. So there's a very um, pay it forward mindset in, in this industry. And um, once I discovered that, I, I really got excited and sort of addicted to teaching other people how to do this and, and seeing them succeed. So I've helped, I don't know, at least 100 authors go from thinking about writing their first book to doing this full time. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh! Plus, plus you have all your own books. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and a back is amazing. Let me tell you, it's really cool to wake up in the morning and already have sold some books. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a number of things like listening to you speak is like listening to my own self <laughs> like, in some ways because I I you don't know this about me, but I also help people. I've just started, but I help um, mostly women go from you know, thinking about writing a book to doing it. And I'm like, you guys, there's no competition. It's actually better for you to to promote other people than it is not. Like, it's, <laughs> it works. Well, one of the things I find interesting is that in the traditional publishing world, men still very much have a stranglehold. But in indie publishing, because anyone can get a book to market, the vast majority of six-figure authors I know are women. Yeah. Oh, really? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, romance is by far and away the most profitable genre. Um, I, I think women know it better, you know, by and large than men. Obviously, there's exceptions. I don't want to, you know, lambast men that write that. I know quite a few that are doing it successfully. But just in, in most of the author groups I'm a part of, um, genres like urban fantasy and, you know, various shades of romance are so popular and there's so much money that can be made there that um, the RWA has sort of trained an entire industry of indie authors to get out there and make a living. And they're some of the smartest, most business savvy people I've ever met. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to an RWA meeting, but I've never come away from one of those and not having learned something. Really? And you go to those? I do. Absolutely. I've been invited to speak at a couple. Oh, fun, fun. Good, good, good. Okay. So I love that. And I'm so glad you said that because a lot of the women that I talk with are just barely starting and there's still kind of, I don't know, have you found this for new people? There's still this um, uncertainty that maybe traditional is still the way to go. And I don't have a problem with people wanting to go traditional, but I'm like, it's going to take a long time. You might not, it might not ever happen and you can make money faster. Indie. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's two reasons I see people still leaning towards traditional publishing. And the, the first um, is, is sort of um, the academic mindset, which is that no good books are going to be self-published. And you don't want your baby that you've worked for years on to be sort of painted with the indie brush and for people to assume that it's pulp or it's trash. And so a lot of authors want to go traditional publishing for that route. And then I think they also see it as more stable and may not understand how much less money you generally make if you're going traditionally published. There are exceptions, of course. I mean, I, I see you know six-figure deals from Audible all the time, and, and the same goes um, with Amazon and a few other publishers. But when somebody says six-figure deal, that's usually not nearly as impressive as it sounds, because typically it's divided over three books, and you're paid in installments based on when those books are delivered. So if you're getting paid, let's say, $120,000, over the next three years to deliver three books, you're getting forty thousand dollars a year. Which I don't know about where where you live, but in, in California, that's not going to cut. <laughs> no, it. no, no, it's not. No, it's not even close to cutting it. I don't live in California anymore, but I do remember when I did, and I think it's gotten worse since I since I lived there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I also really want to acknowledge that you were talking about the gatekeepers because. Um, that's actually the exact, this is why I'm like, oh my gosh, we're like one mind, not one mind, but that's exactly <laughs> what I call it. I'm like the gatekeepers. I often think about how many books, how many books, because it's not like all of a sudden there's all these writers there that nobody ever wanted to write before. People have been writing for a long time and for decades, <laughs> you know, the gatekeepers were stopping books before they could get out into the populace. <laughs> And I'm so grateful now that now it's the people get to decide what do we want to read, not just this handful of folks. <laughs> yeah, I get emails every day after people will watch like a video on my YouTube channel or, or read one of my books for writers where all of a sudden they realize the light bulb will come on. We, we don't have this straight jacket anymore. You really can go out there and just get your own fans and write the stories that you love. And And I think it's a beautiful time to be an author because we've never had this kind of unfettered, unrestricted access to a market before. It's always been we have to go through somebody big who sort of has a stranglehold on the content. Uh, and now it's, it's really the wild west in publishing. Yeah, 
I think I love it. I like I do. I love it. That's why I'm so excited to be here. Okay, so I want to touch on you said write the stories that people love. And you've talked about the stories that you wanted to write are the ones that you, you know, you just wanted to write them. Can you tell us a little bit about um, one, the stories and how, how you have written these stories that you wanted to write? And I guess there's like two parts of this you know, finding your, on the writing side, finding your voice and on the marketing side, matching it to the people that you found that want something that you can offer. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah I do. Um, <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm probably best known as the right to market guy. If you, if you Google right to market and this, I find I'm flabbergasted by this. Usually I'm the first thing that comes up, mm-hmm. you know, for the phrase right to market. I'm not even sure how that happened. It just happens to be the title of one of my books. And the thrust of right to market is you want to find the intersection between a genre that is selling well and something you want to write. So for most authors, we don't just have one story that we're interested in. There, there could be multiple genres. Um, I'm in science fiction and fantasy, and almost every author I know wants to write an epic fantasy. They also want to write some military science fiction. They love Star Wars, so maybe they want to do a space fantasy. Um, they may also like horror, and so they want to blend you know that into one of their genres. And so the, the trick is looking to see what are the things that you really would, would be excited about writing? What are these stories that's been percolating in your head? Could you do and make a living writing it? Because if you write something like, let's say, a weird Western, which is similar to maybe uh, Stephen King's The Dark Tower, you're going to have a very small audience compared to if you write you know, a, a knockoff of, let's say, the Star Trek movies. Uh, so, so really, it's about identifying your market before you go in and actually start writing this story. But the, the mistake I've seen a lot of people make is that they they forget the part where you have to love what you're writing. The audience is, is well aware, I think, um, for most stories, whether or not we're phoning it in or whether or not this is something that we're passionate about. And so I, I think if we're going to be able to do this sustainably long term, you need to be able to make that match where it's got to be fun to write what you're writing, um, but also in a marketable genre, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's really important. I, I'm going to tell a little story. I I wrote a self-help book that I that I put my heart into and it did well. And then I, somebody was like, did you see this cookbook that this guy wrote? And it, and my friend looked up the picture of the guy on the Amazon author and it was a stock photo. <laughs> mm-hmm. know, it was just some guy who was trying to make money making cookbooks. And so I was like, I can make a cookbook. And I made and I wrote a cookbook and uh, I made zero money. And I think that that's because people are so savvy. People are so savvy. <laughs> like mm-hmm. they can tell if your heart is in something or not. <laughs> you know, like they can tell if you're doing it just because you want to make money or not. Now there's some people, there's the there's the other people I think. There's like the one random person here or there that will they just work the system, but in the end I don't think it 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 ends up it's not a long-term thing. Um, so that's my, I really need to stop talking and let you talk. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's just like, I'm very excited by what you're saying. And so, uh, okay. So how, what is, can you get specific and tell us what are the, how did you find your genre and what you wanted to write and then find the audience or how did that happen for you? Like store, like life-wise. So I started out initially, and, and I tend to write what I know, and, and I'm a die-hard fantasy science fiction geek. I've seen pretty much every fantasy and sci-fi movie that's come out in my lifetime. I've read hundreds, if not thousands, of books. I have played many thousands of hours of video games and pen and play for role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. I've been both the game master who kind of invents these game worlds um, and all the characters that are, are contained within them, and I've also been a player in these games. Uh, it's really what I love to do. And so when I sit down and I write a story, I'm sort of synthesizing based on a lifetime of being immersed in all these properties. And, you know, like everybody else in in, um, any genre, I think you're going to draw from the things that you know. So you always want to try to have your unique spin, but I just have that incredible background of all this stuff that I've done. And um, it's not true for every genre that I write in. I was less familiar with military science fiction, but I wanted to venture into that. So when I did that, I found that I needed to do some additional research. I didn't know enough about relativity and um, what Einstein had said about it. And so I got a documentary on Einstein, and I learned all about him, and I learned all about relativity and, and sort of filled in the gaps for things that were missing for me. 
Um, but really it's always been about writing what I am most interested in. So my very first series is not written to market. Um, I I've used this as a, a sort of a cautionary tale, um, in many of my books about, you know, some, some things not to do because I, I did miss market and I did aim it at the wrong audience. It, it looks very much like it's a horror series when in fact it's more, um, post-apocalyptic thriller. So it's sort of about the end of the world and, and this long vanished culture returning. And, and I didn't capture that in the titles or, um, you know, in, in descriptions really adequately enough. And, and that made that series suffer. So I think you can write almost anything, I guess, is the short answer. And that's sort of what I did. The trick is learning then how to market that thing that you've written to the right audience. Ooh. Okay. I want to deep, I want to dive into a little bit, just extrapolate, because a lot of the people that are listening are, are very, very new <laughs> to this. So talk a little bit about titles and the back cover and your description and artwork and how you match how you can match that to the story and to your audience sure so uh, let's think about like the last good book or movie that and this is for the audience that you read and if you want to you know pause the, the podcast and think about this for a minute please do so um but what is the last big movie that surprised you so you weren't aware what this is it's not a sequel to something you've already seen it was something that came out and you were mildly interested and you checked it out and you loved it. Think back to whatever that experience was and, and ask yourself, what is it that drew you in? So for many people, that could be something like The Martian. If you watched The Martian or read the book, what was it about that, that premise that pulled you in? What interested you? And when you can put your finger on, on what that is, then you want to try to mimic that for your book. So you want to create just as interesting a, a a proposition, if you will, for a reader. And that proposition is the combination of your cover, your title, and your blurb. So you want to be able to build all that together in such a way that it presents a compelling argument. So I have an upcoming fantasy series, and one of the, the taglines that I'm using for the, the first book is, it's like Harry Potter meets the Hunger Games. Hmm. You want to be able to paint a picture in a very small amount of words, um, and, and combos like that are a good way to do it, because people who know either one of those properties are going to start automatically inferring what this could be like based on that one thing. And so it's kind of the same thing when you're coming up with titles. So uh, my most recent series is called The Magitech Chronicles, and the first book in the series is called Tech Mage. It's got a cross of technology and magic, and that's very clear both from the cover and from the title. So when you see this, there's no mystery. You know exactly what you're going to get. It's going to be dragons on starships, um, magic in space, and dead gods. All of that is very well represented in the covers, the title, and the blur. Because as a reader, when I'm browsing and I'm trying to find something cool and new to read, I'm really looking for images initially, and that's the covers. And then maybe I'm going to read the title, and maybe I'm going to read the blurb. And if all those things kind of build an interesting you know, proposition where I think maybe I'm going to want to spend eight hours in that book, then I'll buy it. It's the same as when you fire up Netflix and you're scrolling through looking for that next show you want to binge. What is it about that show that makes you want to check it out? What word or combination of words drew you in? And if you can start identifying that just by looking at other successful books and, and series, um, it really makes you better at doing it yourself. Wow. I really, I, I don't think I've ever heard and. Because a lot of people I've talked about this, but the, with the titles is so specific. Your your series and your titles are very like they tell you immediately without being without being like this book is about magic in space. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, like that. It's really obvious what it is just from those two words, the tech mage. That's one the and tech mage is is it one word tech mage. That's two mages, or that's two mages, two, <laughs> two words. words. Okay, okay, so three <laughs> words. You know what it is. Like, it's just, that's really... Um... It, it doesn't have to be easily identifiable. In my case, I, I did that because it's blending two genres, but, like, I've got another book that's just military science fiction, and this is designed to draw people's interest just from the title, and the title is Dreyker's Folly. Ooh. So people want to know, okay, who is Dreyker and what's this folly that he committed? Like right off the bat, there's some curiosity there. I'm trying to sort of open a loop with the reader and get them to want to read the description just so they can answer that question. And of course, when they read the description, I'm going to answer four more questions, which can only be answered by reading the book. <laughs> That's what I call, I call it building tension. I'm like, there's enough tension in the, in the, well, I like how you did it with even the title. And I think that's really 
a lot of people that I've talked to, the title is like, they want it to be some kind of artistic thing. And I really am like, you guys, everything besides the story is marketing. <laughs> and like the story, even to some extent, if you're writing to market, can be marketing. But but truly everything besides the story is marketing, including the title. And it's, it's not some summary of what's in the what's in the story. So I really love how you're just saying it and everybody's going to be and you have such amazing examples of how you're using what you're talking about. So thank you. Um let's see. Gosh, I have a lot of questions based on based <laughs> on what I'm like there's so much information in here. Okay, so can you tell us tell us a little bit about your writing routine and how do you make time to write? Uh, so once upon a time, I worked at a San Francisco startup, and I was the sole software engineer. I made an iPhone app. So we're talking, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day programming. And, and, you know, by the time I would take the bus home in the evenings, I was just drooling on myself and ready for bed. So when in that lifestyle do you find time to write? And, and, and I don't even have kids yet. So there are a lot of people who have even more responsibilities than what I have with just that job. So I, I think a lot of the audience knows how hard it is to find time to write. And so this is where my first nonfiction book for writers comes from. It's called 5,000 Words Per Hour. It was about my sort of gamification process where I was trying to track and increase my words per hour every single day because I only had one hour a day where I could write. And that was the bus ride into the city from my house. So I would sit down you know, in that bouncing chair on the bus with a laptop in my lap, trying to get down as many words as possible. And over time, I learned that I could do concentrated writing sprints that varied between, let's say, you know, five and 20 minutes and get down a ton of words. And in a typical hour, I got good enough that I could do 3,500 words on the way to, to work. And so every day, even though I had this really, really challenging job, I was still getting the words down I needed to get down um, simply by doing these writing sprints. These days, now that I, I write full time, um, I have a very regimented process where my first writing sprint begins at 7 a.m. And by 11 a.m., I have done my daily word count, which, depending on the project, is either five or 7,000 words. Some, some of them are a little longer and need to be um, written a little more intensely. But either way, that word count is always finished before I leave for lunch. And then once I get back from lunch, the rest of my day is spent handling all the business stuff and the marketing and the, the billion other things they don't tell you about that we have to do as authors. <laughs> Okay. And can you tell us a little bit? Um, I think that's really good. I, I'm i sorry. I'm going to say how awesome you are every single time you say something. That's basically what's <laughs> going to happen. I mean, like, thank you, Chris, for sharing both because you know it's so useful for people to know how you did it when you had a full-time job. And you guys, I used to live in the, in the you know, near where he's talking about and all of the software engineers do work 12-hour days. <laughs> it's like the, the, the you would think oh 8 a.m rush hour traffic not in that area it's at 10 a.m <laughs> 10 a.m is when all the software engineers go into work and they stay and then and then at 10 p.m you've got another rush hour <laughs> with all of them going home <laughs> not if you're taking a bus um and then what you're doing now i think that's great so you guys if you want to know how he's doing the 5,000, read his book what's the book called again 5,000 words per hour. And you can get it for free by going to chrisfoxwrites.com and just, you know, signing up to the mailing list. Or if you want, it's available on Amazon as well. It's definitely my most popular book for, for writers. Okay. So you can, we're not going to deep dive into that here because you can go get it in the book. So what do you do? I, I want to delve a little bit into your, just the writing, writing, like how do you do the story? That's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> my last nonfiction book is called Plot Gardening. Okay. And probably the most populous type of videos on my channel have been um, plotting and outlining videos because that's the, the most hotly requested topic. So over the last like three or four years, I've really refined my methodology. Um, I started out as a pantser. I wrote by the seat of my pants, didn't do much in the way of outlining. Then I decided that wasn't working. I became a diehard outliner and that worked really well because I knew you know what direction my story should be going and I was able to write them more quickly. Um, but in the end, I settled on sort of a hybrid approach where now I call it plot gardening, where I'll do some creative freeform writing and lots of world building, but I will also have an outline. So it's now a mixture of both processes. And this happens all the time. So maybe I'm standing in line at, at Safeway, excuse me, purchasing my, my groceries, um, and I'll whip out my smartphone and I've got Scrivener. So I'll, I'll add some notes 
on a character maybe that I just brainstormed into that Scrivener document. And I might not actually be sitting down to write that particular novel for weeks or even months, but I'm slowly um, accreting characters and concepts and ideas and cool scenes and, and stuff that's just occurring to me so that when I do sit down to formulate a real timeline, I'm, I'm familiar with the characters. I know a little bit more about their world and, and sort of about the conflict that will arise naturally between them. Okay. And then when you sit down at some point to write it, you just go, can you talk a little bit about what you do that with all those concepts? Okay. So yeah, so I, I do <laughs> I'll get into the more granular approach. Yeah. So, so what I'll do is I start with a single document and I'll write out my description of what I think the story is going to be. So it's usually just, you know, free form three or four paragraphs of this is the book I think I'm going to write. I may not know who the protagonist is and I may not know who, um, you know, the antagonist is going to be. I just know some broad strokes. Like I'm going to write this type of book. The example that I use um, in plot gardening is if you were going to write yourself like, a thriller, a James Bond style thriller. You might not know who your James Bond knockoff character is going to be, even what gender they are. You know, it could be science fiction. Maybe they're a different alien race. You have no idea yet, but you have kind of a vague concept of who this person is. And and then I'll sit down and, and try to figure out more about the story that I want to write. And I'll, I'll nail down that genre. Am I writing a horror novel? Am I writing a, a fantasy novel? Is this going to be a thriller? Because the emotional needs of your genre is the most important part to you fleshing a story. If you are writing a romance novel and 75% of the way through that novel, an Axperger busts in through the door and kills your love interest, that's no longer a romance novel. <laughs> no. And your audience is going to be pissed when they read that. So before I can sit down and write a story, I need to understand what type of story I'm writing. And only then do I sit down and do an outline. And it's, it's usually much easier at that point. Most of what I write follows the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's work, through um, something called Dan Harmon's Story Circle. I've got a video on this, and, and plot gardening explains it as well. Um, but it walks you through each of the plot points, and it sort of welds character development and plot together. So your character is growing and changing throughout the story as that story is occurring. And this is a methodology by which you can create that story. And it's not the only story form. There's lots of other ones that can be followed. But for my genre, action and adventure and science fiction and fantasy, it's definitely the most popular one for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph Campbell has some amazing stuff. And The Hero's Journey is a very I think it, I think it's, well, I read a lot of fantasy, so <laughs> I'm like, it's one of the best ones <laughs> from somebody who that's basically what I read. And, um, okay. Okay. So then you've done all this and you guys, you're listening, but if you want to get deep, deep, deep dive into it, go check out his plot gardening book. And I'm going to put links to all these and I'm going to be like re-listening through and I'm going to be like, he talked about Dan something. <laughs> All of these things will be in the, in the show notes. Because <laughs> I'm like, I want to listen to that right now. So then as you, you've got this general idea, you're in the in line at Safeway, you know, getting some yummy. I miss Safeway. Okay, you're in the line at Safeway, <laughs> picking up some yummy soups. And, uh, <laughs> and you're like, hey, I've had this idea. So do you have at any um, one time, like a number of books that you have on your in your Scrivener. That... I typically have um, five to six going at once. Okay. Now, when I say five to six going at once, what I really mean is I'm writing one book, mm -hmm. but then I also have like five other ideas that are the closest to being the next book I'm going to write. And I'm usually adding little tidbits to each of those. And, and so, you know, maybe I'm on a morning hike and all an, an idea will occur to me about um, a plot that I don't intend to touch for another six months. Um, I, I want a way to capture that stuff because what I found is if I don't do that, then the ideas that I have that relate to other stories will sort of sneak their way in into whatever it is I'm currently writing. Oh, <laughs> so it's like it's going to happen some way or another. <laughs> <laughs> you... Right. You know, you think of an idea, you think it's cool. I, I, if I don't put it where it properly belongs in the story that it properly belongs, then it'll find its way into whatever I'm writing. Okay. So then, okay. So I'm just walking me, myself and the audience through. So at any one point, you're just working on one book, but you're kind of brainstorming and putting different ideas down. Maybe not brainstorming, but as you have ideas, you're putting them for other books. And then when you get to them, you've got so much already kind of completed. 
right? Exactly. You've got that basic world building and, and maybe a few of the characters that you want to work with. And maybe you found like this really cool piece of artwork that looks exactly how you envisioned your protagonist. And, you know, just a few little tidbits like that is enough so that when you do finally take that project and say, okay, I'm going to write this book now, then it's much easier to sit down and sort of harness your subconscious and write uh, a compelling kind of plot that you think is going to work. I love that because a lot of the people that I talk to I mean, because writers are very, very creative. And so they're like, what do I do? I'm working on this one book, but I just had an idea for another book. And so you're saying you've, you've developed the solution of, well, yeah, you can do the other book. <laughs> but just <laughs> when you have those ideas, put that in the document, <laughs> save it. And then when you get there, it'll be so much faster and easier to work on it. Yeah, it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So what is your, do you, do you just write and what's your revision process? Do you revise? Do you send it to an editor? What do you do at that point? Um, I have what I call a, a one pass editing process, which is actually multiple passes. So it's very poorly named. <laughs> um, I'll start, I'll start with a read through of the book uh, and I'll just read it cover to cover. And I am not allowed to make changes. I can add notes about things that I think need to be fixed or problems that I run into. And, you know, if I want to, I can fix typos, but I try to prevent myself from doing that just so I'll finish reading the book all, you know, kind of at once. So I can take in the entire story in the same sitting, ideally. Um, And then once I've done that, then it's time to go through and rewrite it. And this is, I guess, where my one pass comes in. Um, I'll take all the notes that I have done through the course of the book, I'll figure out which chapters need to be cut, edited, or rewritten. I'll start at chapter one, and I'll just go chapter by chapter and make every single fix that I wanted to do. And then when I finish the document, um, I'll typically read it one more time and fix whatever typos I can find, and then it's off to the editor. Okay. And the editor comes back, says, here's what XYZ you got to do. How long does it take um, you to make the changes from the editor? Usually one day. Okay. And then you release it? Right. And, and note that in the beginning, it wasn't nearly this fast and I would have a lot of drafts and, you know, there'd be back and forth and it would take me four weeks after I got a draft back from the editor to make the changes I needed to. Mm -hmm. But now that I've got, you know, 25, 26 books out, it's way, way easier for me to do this very quickly and efficiently. And because I understand story structure and and what makes for a good hero's journey story, um, I have to do a lot less rewriting these days. It's very rare for me to have to remove chapters. Um, Mm -hmm. It's much more likely that I'll need to add like a bridge chapter where something wasn't adequately explained to the reader. So my books tend to get longer as I edit, not shorter. Yeah, I'm actually I just started a done in three months program for the people and that I'm coaching. And, uh, and part of the I'm like, part of the reason why done in three months, there's a lot of reasons for the Amazon thing and da da da. But I was like, main thing, especially for new writers is you don't find your writer voice, you don't find you like you practice improves things <laughs> mm-hmm. immensely <laughs> right so the more books you put out the faster it is to put them out because you know the processes and i'm not talking just about you know the writing process although that's really useful cuz you learn your writing process but also like the whole process around cuz you said you guys he just does his writing from 7 to 11 and then the rest of the day is all the other stuff which maybe we should talk about in a second but you learn all the other stuff faster too. You learn formatting. You learn. <laughs> you learn. You learn uh, how you have to market. You have to learn all the other things. Uploading it to think. The more times you do that, the less you have to worry about it. It just becomes- yeah. If you think about what what you do for a living right now, whatever that job might might be, you probably do it eight plus hours a day. What if you only did that job like an hour once every other week? Um, what would your level of mastery at that job be? Probably far, far less than what it is. Because if you do something eight hours a day, you're constantly learning and optimizing and improving. And you know the same holds true for writing and all of the extra skills we have to know, like uh, marketing or, or you know, uh, finding people that we can network with to, to share our book and communities or all that stuff is just practice. Mm-hmm. And not just practicing writing. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people get stuck in because you can keep practicing writing on the same one book, and that's not what I mean. And I don't think that's what Chris means. <laughs> He's like, like you can r- work on the same one book for a long time, but that's not what we're talking about as practicing. It's completing the books and then moving to the next one and that process. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in the afternoon after you're done with your writing? 
Uh, sure. So my, my day is a little bit less typical than, than most authors. I, I do um, interviews in the afternoon, and I've got a lot of those. I also do um, consulting with a lot of high-profile authors to help with their backlist or, or, or current releases if they have stuff coming out. So that stuff happens in the afternoon. Um, before that branch of my business started becoming as big as it is, uh, I would do things like plotting in the afternoon. I would rebuild my Amazon or Facebook ads. Um, I would do social media, which can be very important to go network in communities and talk to other authors and just sort of take the pulse of what's going on in the industry. So that's kind of when all that stuff happens. Um, Lots of little tasks that they don't tell you about. Things like you're going to have to make a, a, a cover brief for your cover artist which is really just a mock-up where you're kind of sketching up what you want them to create. Um, that's when I would do that. And, and I have to make a few of those each week. So there's all these little tasks that tend to pile up. And, and honestly, they take more time than the writing itself. There's this perception that you're going to spend all your time writing and you're going to sit around you know, with your pipe and your, your tweed jacket. Uh, when in reality, the vast majority of stuff I find myself doing these days is business-related, not writing-related. I... <laughs> I have the same thing because I want to participate in my own done in three months program. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've got to block out this time for writing because I'm so busy doing all the other things. It's a lot of time. Yeah. But you guys, you'd have to be doing it anyways, even if you were traditionally published because they don't do the marketing for you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless of which way you go, there's no out. You have to do your own marketing. But the fun part is that you are responsible. You, you get to be 100% responsible for your success or not. Um, so when you were first starting, what marketing strategies did you use? Obviously, now you're a bit well, well known. <laughs> so but what were you using that worked when you started? Or what would you say is working now? Or where is the overlap from what worked? And what is still well, when working? I when I first started, um, I had the luxury of working for a cutting edge startup and understanding a lot about how technology worked, including Amazon um, and how it sells books. It's book recommendation system, what is commonly referred to as the algorithm. Although algorithm is just a fancy programmer word for I don't want to explain it to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I started learning uh, data science and understanding how Amazon would paddle books or other products where their whole goal is to keep people on the Amazon site as long as possible and show them the thing that they are most likely to buy. And I realized that if readers like a certain type of book and they see a cover that is very similar to that type of book, they're much, much more likely to buy it. So I looked at all the covers around me, and now this is common knowledge, and everybody says it, and it's just the way things are done. But back then, this was considered cutting-edge information in, in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I got really, really good at modeling other covers. Or if I was going to write a book that didn't fit in another genre, I got really good at broadcasting what elements made that cover unique and, and what people might get out of reading it. So my very first book was called No Such Thing as Werewolves. And you've got this giant werewolf standing in front of a very Egyptian-looking pyramid. And that evoked a lot of questions enough to get people to read the description. So I, I learned that your marketing presentation, what I call passive marketing, is infinitely more important than any active marketing you do. And back then, people would just throw money at ads. They, you know, Any ad service that cropped up that was willing to accept our money, we would just toss money at them and say, sell our book. But if you have a terrible cover and a bad description, it doesn't matter how great your book is. No one's going to want to read that. And if you get 40,000 people to look at your product page and only eight of them buy the book, you know, you've got a serious problem. So I got really good at really kind of assembling a great Amazon product page and making sure my cover fit the genre and looked great and was very competitive. Um, and that was really all it took. Amazon started doing the rest and they, they cheerfully showed my book to lots of different audiences and um, sold a whole bunch of copies on my behalf. And I've sort of since then learned better ways to, I don't want to say game, but better ways to utilize the Amazon system to sell books. And really, it comes down to figure out who your audience is, what do these people want to read, and then show them that so they know your book is what they want to read. It's so simple. It sounds so simple when you say it like that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, simple. To, it is simple, but it doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> and I still mess up, I would say, probably 30% of the time. So like I did on my YouTube channel, 12 Weeks to a Trilogy, and I put together these three books, and I got my covers, and I was super excited, and I put them out there, and it flopped. Oh. It flopped badly. I made, you know, I made, I made broke even, but the, the books did not sell like most of my other stuff did. And the reason is I miscalculated on the covers. I screwed up the covers, and I've since gone back and fixed the covers. But 
you know, at the time, I, I kind of made an educated guess and, and was wrong. So you're going to screw up and you are going to make mistakes. But the beauty of working in today's ecosystem is you can change covers, blur, whatever you want, whenever you want. Yeah. Did you relaunch somehow after you changed the covers or did you just like change them and now they're doing better? Um, I did it in two stages. So the first stage was I took, um, I had two trilogies that were in the same universe, but there was no visual cue when you looked at the covers to tell readers that. And I put them into one six book series and rebranded it as a six book series instead of two trilogies. Um, and that was phase one. And I've already done that phase two, which I'm going to do in probably another three months. Um, and then I'm going to do a full relaunch where all six books are in the same series and all the covers have been changed. So um, you, you sort of can get a lot of bang for your buck and relaunch something more than once. Excuse me. And each time I'm trying to gather more information about what the right way and the wrong way to launch a book is because it's always changing over time. And, and really, as authors, all we can do is keep experimenting and learning from every experiment. Yeah, that is. Uh, OK, I like that you're saying that you're going to make mistakes because sometimes I think a lot of people who are just starting out, you, we only see the end result. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't see the, the, hey, like, what if I go to your Amazon page right now, I look at the covers, I'm like, these look great. I didn't see the previous iterations <laughs> of the covers. Right. And, and you can still see a little bit of that. So if you leaf back all the way to the beginning of my backlist, you'll see Hero Rising and Hero Born. I still have a couple of terrible covers that I've, I've never relaunched. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can get a glimpse at my roots as, as an early author. But yeah, I, I screw up all the time. And, and one of the dangers in this industry, especially if you become, you know, sort of an influencer or a pundit, or I don't know what you want to call me, a, a talking head, um, somebody that, that people are quoting often, is if you admit that you don't know something, then it undermines your authority and people assume that you have no clue what you're talking about. But what I've done since the very beginning has been honest about every mistake that I've made. Because whenever you get involved in a career like this, you're going to screw up a lot. The question is, are you still able to make a profit doing it? And are you still here tomorrow dusting yourself off after you mess up? So I screw up just as often as I succeed. But the, the difference is, I think, with a lot of other authors... I learn from those mistakes. And the next time I try and experiment, it's with the benefit of the previous mistakes I've made. Yeah. Plus, it's a lot easier to present yourself as fallible than it is to present yourself as perfect. <laughs> yes. Yes, this is true. I've given up on the perfection. I'm like, you know what? That is just never going to happen. <laughs> like my hair will not allow it. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Um, but I think uh, that speaks to something. And I think it speaks to the auth auth how much people appreciate authenticity now more than just the perception of something. What do you think about that in terms of marketing? I have statistical data that backs that up. And it's been interesting. So I'm in a mastermind with a few of the other players. If I said the names, you guys would, would recognize them all. I'm sure it's all um, people who run companies in the author space. Uh, so we can sort of compare numbers. And we did a webinar with Alex from Kalytics, and, and each of us did a webinar with him. And then we sort of were able to contrast the numbers afterwards. And I have the lightest touch. I barely email my lists for nonfiction. When I do, it's always me giving them some free content. Um, I, I don't ask a lot from them. I don't do a lot of webinars. And so my conversion was much, much higher than these other business people because they hit their list like you know once twice a week they're always selling them something and it's always something that people can use but because i do it so much less frequently and with such a more of a high touch kind of uh, personal attention um I, I think people are a little more loyal and i think they're a little bit more willing to help me out because i ask so little in return mm. oh my gosh that's such a beautiful like you're teaching me right now chris <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, like this morning I was having this like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give great value. I'm just going to give amazing value and have fun and let the rest work itself out. And you're just like synchronicity <laughs> like, helping me out here. But I think it's amazing. Like, I think it's really, really useful for everybody who's listening too, because a lot of people don't know what to put in their newsletters. A lot of people starting out don't know what to put in their newsletters and don't know how to get people on them. So can you talk a little bit about that briefly? Yes. And I've made a lot of mistakes on newsletters and, and continue to. So this is an area where I can offer some hard-won <laughs> wisdom. Um, be consistent. 
always be consistent. Whatever you're going to do, be consistent with it. And it doesn't matter what you say in that email as long as it's authentic. So I know some authors will talk about their personal life and their fans love that. And I think it's a great idea. If you can connect with your fans in that way, you're going to make lifelong fans. And and that is a really smart thing to do. Um, But it isn't necessary. Lots of people don't want to share their life. They don't want to talk about that stuff. So if all you want to do is send out an email whenever a new book comes out, that's just fine. And that's usually going to be enough, especially if you release fairly frequently. So pick a schedule, pick something you want to talk about, and then go with it. Maybe if you are a science fiction author, maybe you want to talk about what you thought of Altered Carbon or Stranger Things or whatever the latest thing that came out on Netflix that you watched was. Um, Try to offer something you think that people on your list will be interested in valuable. Maybe you wrote a free short story you can give away um, just because you thought it was fun and you were part of a contest. Um, or, or maybe you have none of that stuff and you're just curious about things like how did they find your list? So send them a survey and say, Hey guys, I'm just curious as to how you discovered me. You know, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what was the first science fiction property that you were interested in? And, and they'll reply back to you and you'll get a dialogue going. So, um, like everything else in authordom, it's about experimentation, but also like everything else, uh, consistency is rewarded. If, if you are going to tend to your mailing list and you only send an email once a year, these people are not going to remember who you are. And so, so you do need to at least touch bases with them periodically, I think. You would think like, I would say probably once a month. I, I think in, in hindsight, once a month is, is probably the best way you could do it if you don't want to send a lot of emails. Mm-hmm. Um, I was releasing uh, a specific series and I was only emailing that list when a book came out in that series and it was taking me six to eight books, excuse me, six to eight months to get a book out. Um, by the time I sent another email, uh, I was getting just such low engagement. The, the list had been, you know, gone cold. So mm-hmm. there is that danger of the list going cold if you're not not emailing them frequently. And I think once a month is enough to prevent that from happening. Yeah, I think minimum once a month. Okay. What, uh, how did you get the people on your email list? Uh, so it depends on the list. I have lots of different ones. Okay. Um, I started with um, the traditional reader magnet that Nick Stevenson taught the author world about, which is in the beginning and ba- the front and back matter of your book, you just give away a free short story or novella or something you think your readers will be interested in um, in exchange for a sign up to your email list. And they're going to see this at the beginning and end of every book that you put out. And then I also have those listed on my website. So if you show up at any of the websites like magitechchronicles.com or chrisfoxwrites.com, you're going to see a place where you can download some of my work for free. And then, of course, I get your email address. And and that's probably 80% of the email addresses. Mm -hmm. The last 20% are all coming from YouTube. I don't do any sort of advertising to get um, email signups. Everything that I get 100% is organic. And after my last purge, I think I still have like 14,000 email addresses. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love it. So the key, you guys, is to keep writing good books. <laughs> yes, as many as possible. <laughs> it's not like, how do I get people to sign up for my email? It's like, keep writing books, have an invitation, a smart invitation at the beginning and the end, and then write some more. <laughs> yeah, and this harkens back to our own reader experiences. So try to imagine if you had started reading Harry Potter Um, And the world didn't know who Harry Potter was and had never heard of Harry Potter. It wasn't a super popular series yet, but you loved it because it's Harry Potter. And you get four books in and you find out that J.K. Rowling hasn't written book five yet. What are you going to do as a reader if you see a link that says, hey, listen, you can download this map of Hogwarts and this free short story about Dumbledore, Dumbledore when he was a student. And in exchange, you know, I'll also email you when the next book in the series comes out. It's sort of a no brainer for your real fans. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think um, I have a couple of people who are like who and maybe this is more among women than among men. I'm not sure. But that feel like why like they're trying to scam somebody by giving them something in return for an email address. (laughs) And And I'm like, no, that's not how it is. When you're a fan, you you want to be notified. You want it's not. (laughs) <laughs> it's not like you're trying to scam somebody out of their email address so that you can sell them stuff. It's, can you talk a little bit about, do you know what I'm saying? I, I do. I do. There's, there's a mindset amongst authors that we don't want to be scummy marketers. Like yeah. for so long, we haven't had to do any marketing because in, in theory, the traditional publishing world would do that for us. So we could just be these, you know, authors who would be artists and sit in our ivory towers and, you know, let the, the men sh- do the, the marketing. But the reality is, no, every author needs to market. And marketing is not necessarily a bad thing as long as you are providing something that readers want. Like, you're giving them a short story that they love in a universe that they're absolutely enjoying in exchange 
for an email. And all that email is going to do is allow you to tell them when more of your stuff is ready. And these are the people that are interested. So you're actually doing them a favor. And they, of course, are going to return that favor by buying your book when it comes out. And, and there's nothing scummy about that. If you're selling their email address, yes. uh, you know, now we, we got to talk because you know, you're doing something unethical. That's a little different. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, this whole interview has been so much fun because every <laughs> time you speak, I'm like, yep, done, period, amen. um can you tell us um two more questions can you tell us about an obstacle or challenge that you've faced in your journey to be uh uh writing full-time right and how you work through it yeah um when i first became a full-time author I, i didn't understand what that meant And so what I did when I worked at at CellScope, that was the last startup I had a job at before I became a full-time author. Um, I paid off literally all of my debt. I paid off my truck loan. I paid off, you know, credit cards, everything that I had. And then I just started, you know, like a fire hose. Every money that, you know, I got from Amazon or Audible or any of my endeavors went into a savings account. And I saved up um, over a full year's worth of expenses in just this account. And that was going to be sort of my like emergency nest egg. And then I quit my job. And my thought was, okay, I've got all this money in the bank. I should be fine. But nothing prepares you for the huge, huge change in how your life is going to work. When you are a full-time employee for a company, you have to show up at a certain time, you have to dress a certain way, you leave at a certain time. And most importantly, you get a paycheck at the same time, be it monthly, be it bi-weekly, however your, your payment is. And that's not the same when you're an author. So you can have a month that is $25,000, and the next month can be eight, and the one after that can be four. So you can't really predict what your income is going to be ahead of time. And this leads to constant, never-ending stress and the fear that it's all going to come crashing down. So every author that I know um, is frantically putting out books as quickly as they can and saving up every penny that they can because we have this constant fear that the sky is going to fall and our industry is going to go away. And and that stress pervaded, man, every part of my life. I just, I could never stop thinking about work. And I had a really tough year in 2017 as a result because of that mental obstacle. It took a lot of retraining my brain to to get to a point where I'm okay with, um, with infrequent income. I make more money than I ever had, but because it's paid differently than when I, I worked in the startup world, I, you know, I've got to combat that 40 years of being an adult and getting a paycheck. Hmm. Mm. How did you combat it? How did you figure it out mentally? Um, I started averaging and I stopped checking in constantly. So I started like, I would look at my sales numbers instead of every 20 minutes. And then literally that's what I would do. (laughs) If I sold some books, if I sold some books, um, I would start checking once a week or Mm. maybe even once a month, some months. I just wouldn't really look as often. I would do the things that I needed to do, which is I would set my ads up at the beginning of a month if I was running some ads, but I wouldn't spend nearly as much time obsessing. And then eventually I started cutting out social media because especially on Facebook, all of us are part of a whole bunch of communities where the sky is perpetually falling and Amazon is doing this terrible thing. And -and so-and-so just got rank stripped and their whole back catalog is gone you know, we're always afraid. And and I was letting that fear kind of rule my life. So I pulled back, I started doing a lot less social media and a lot more um, of just looking at the big picture and thinking, okay, if I'm making, you know, $25,000 this month and only $8,000 that, you know, next month, that's actually enough to, to cover me for the next four or five months. And then that's how I need to look at it. Not, oh God, my income is going down. Yeah. That's really powerful. And I think that's a really good tool is to step back and not let yourself be overwhelmed or consumed. <laughs> by, yeah, <laughs> by, it's very hard to be creative when you're when you're scared. I, in my experience, it's it's harder to be like, okay, I'm going to sit down and write. <laughs> Terrified. It's not. Yeah, it's not a good way to live when you've got an Amazon pre order hanging over your head and have to finish a novel, but you're also worried about income. That's I yeah. did that for a lot of, of last year, and and I, I think I'm going to pass in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try and entertain you guys while I'm terrified about my income. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to other authors who want to achieve this dream of writing full time? Accept that it's going to take you a long time to get there and stop trying to compare yourself to other people. Because as you mentioned earlier in this interview, it's really easy for us to look at somebody like Andy Weir and say he's an overnight success without understanding that it actually took him like eight years to get where he was. The same is true for Hugh Howie. So if you're going to be comparing yourself to other people, but don't know the challenges they're going through, you're going to make yourself feel bad. 
um, if at all possible, compare yourself to yourself. Are you writing more words per hour? What did you do? What one thing today that got you a little bit ahead? And, and let that be enough. Don't worry where you're at in relation to other authors. Only worry if your trajectory is going in the right direction. Period. I, you guys, everything that Chris Fox says is quotable. <laughs> <laughs> Like he just says it like it is. And then there's a period at the end and done. <laughs> Quote complete. <laughs> no wonder so many people are referencing you, Chris. Because <laughs> you just say it in a very quotable way. Okay. Um, that's you guys. This is uh, this is Chris Fox. He's new now. Tell us about your latest book and where people can find you best. So my latest book, I am currently writing the fourth book in the Magitech Chronicles uh, entitled War Mage. Tons and tons of fun. Um, dragons and spellships and dead gods. Lots and lots of, of the stuff that I love all kind of mixed together. Um, you can find out more about me, about my YouTube channel, the videos and articles that I write for free for authors um, at chrisfoxwrites.com. Pretty much everything about me is there. Yeah. And you guys, that is a really excellent link. Like, He's got really, really good resources because uh, so definitely, definitely check out Chris Fox writes dot com, his YouTube channel and his books, because I read his book before. I've watched not all of your YouTube videos, but I've watched a couple and bookmarked them and been like, I'm coming back to that when I get to that point in my book. <laughs> so, <laughs> like really knowledgeable, really generous. And uh, and we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, thank you. Um, if you uh, enjoyed this, please go check out his stuff. And thank you for being here and listening. Hugs and happy authoring here from Author Like a Boss. Hey, boss, you made it to the end of the episode. You're the best. Because of that, I'm going to give you a special invitation to find out more about the Author Boss Academy, where I and a bunch of really awesome authors hang out, have fun, and get stuff done. If you end up joining, tell me the secret word and you'll get a special bonus. Find out more about the Academy at authorlikeaboss.com forward slash Academy. The secret word is nipples. <laughs> Hugs and happy authoring. I hope to see you soon. If you love the Author Like a Boss podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time.